I'm Natalia Loback, and this is Change Course. How to build an amazing culture. August is Culture Month here at the Change Course podcast and at charthouse.ca. So we're almost wrapping up, but stay tuned for our content this week around culture and change. And if you missed our previous episodes, certainly link um, back and listen to those, as well as check out the various um, articles and posts that we've done this month around organizational culture and change. I'm sure that you'll find it interesting, enlightening, and helpful. Our theme has been Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose by uh, the epigram by writer uh, Jean-Baptiste Alphonse Carr in 1849 um, wrote this meaning the more it changes, the more it stays the same. Or the more things change, the more things stay the same. So what I wanted to talk to you about this week was how do you build a great culture? Well, guess what? I've got great news for you. If you're the leader, you're in charge of the culture. I discussed this in the last episode, but let's say that you are starting a brand new team, a groundbreaking team, um, and you have the opportunity to build a great culture. Well, culture is becoming one of the key areas that is providing teams and organizations with competitive advantage. And if you want to attract the best talent to your organization or to your initiative, you need to be thinking about culture. It's hugely important. So the best news I have for you is if you're leading a team and you want to build an amazing culture, great. You're in charge because not only are you in charge of what that team is doing and the value that they're providing or the mission that you're seeking to accomplish, but you are also in charge of the culture within your organization or your team. So two things here. One, you could be creating a team as part of a broader organization. So some of the thoughts from last week around, um, building culture or changing culture within subculture and how those two are related. Um, that's one way that you could be building an incredible culture. So if you have to build it within a prevailing culture, what is that subculture that you're looking to build? The second piece is maybe it is a brand new organization that has no affiliation or no connection with any other organization or group. You absolutely have the ability to create and define that culture. And it's just as important as defining your strategy. So how do you do this? I mean, most of us, when we think about strategic planning, have an idea of what that looks like. But cultural planning can be pretty similar, but then also it can be a little bit more difficult. So let me explain what I mean. When we talk about culture, we often talk about adjectives. Uh, So descriptors of what the culture is like. It was collegial. Everyone got along really well. The collaboration was amazing. And, um, you know, my leader was really nice to me, uh, you know, all these things. You can probably describe at length some of the best cultures that you've been a part of using a lot of descriptive words or adjectives. What you need to do when defining those cultural attributes is actually talk about the interactions and the behaviors, as I talked about last week. So you need to define what that looks like in practice. So it can't be, oh, my leader was really nice. What it can be is, my leader, as a leader, I care about my people. And I demonstrate this by 
talking with them about their lives at home, learning about what their life is like, learning about who they are and what their interests are, remembering these things about them and thinking about and creating a relationship, a personal relationship, as well as a working relationship with the people that I'm leading. That's how you describe a behavior. And you could see that I described interactions in there as well. For example, you could say, uh, when I bring my team together for a meeting, we have a specific activity that happens at the beginning of the team. One of the things we value in our organization is community service. And so at the beginning of each meeting, I will ask each team member or one team member at each meeting to stand up and talk about the community service that they participate in so we can hear about that and learn about what they are doing. That's an example of a behavior as well as an interaction linked to the value of the organization and the culture that you are trying to create. As you can see, you can start to see how you're defining what is important and valued in the organization as well. So if you've already figured out maybe what your purpose is and also your values that you want to espouse, you now can start to break that down and look at how does that value come to life? What do the behaviors and interactions around that value actually look like in practice? I talked about the amazing culture that I recently worked with, with a group of physicians. And this, I'm going to share this example because it just really crystallized for me how value, uh, values of an organization, behaviors and interactions fall together and fall in line. One of the values of this organization is equal pay for time because they have a number of different activities that they do. And because of the way that they've set themselves up in terms of compensation with the organization that they serve, they have different activities that they do, some of which are revenue generating and others which generate different kinds of value. They don't make money, but they deliver incredible value to their organization and to their part of the services that they provide um, to the organization that they work with. Now, when we talk about equal pay for time, what they meant was that any activity that you are doing that is quote unquote on the clock in terms of work that you are doing for this organization it gets paid the same amount, whether it's a revenue generating activity or whether it's not. So what that did was it opens up and it ensures equality among all the activities that are being done. So let's say that you are providing a certain type of service that's revenue generating, but it doesn't generate as much money as another service that somebody is providing. What this creates is an incredible quality of all of the people that are working within the organization. What it also does is it makes it easy for you if you have, if you're one of the members of the organization and let's say you need to take some time off or you have some other commitment that you need to make that's a work commitment or otherwise, um, you can easily find someone to help you. And so it created this incredible environment of support and collaboration and collegiality because the financial piece was taken away. Now, in other organizations, that's not the case. So there is a differential between the service that's being provided and the amount that the individual is compensated. And so what you see there is a little bit more um, territorialism. Uh, You don't have people helping one another. It's difficult. You kind of have to build alliances, a bit more survivor-like. Doesn't sound like a really fun place to work. I think I'd like to work at the organization that I talked about. So equal time, equal pay creates equality. And it created equality in such a way that it actually started to break down some of the barriers that were in the prevailing culture as well. And I talked a little bit about that, the culture of medicine being patriarchal. You see uh, in many ways um, sexism playing out. 
and also for people of color and women of color, especially, um, you know, having a much more difficult time becoming successful in that environment. So in this little subculture, you started to see that there was this equality because all of a sudden your leadership positions were compensated equally. And so if the leadership positions were also being compensated, it opened up a lot more opportunity for people who weren't doing this on a volunteer basis. And I can talk a little bit about, you know, prevailing family structures in medicine and all of that kind of stuff, but it's still, you know, prevailing culture, sometimes quite traditional, much more difficult for women to step up into leadership positions for a whole host of reasons. But what we started to see in this organization was those barriers were starting to break down. Isn't that incredible? So you see the value of time. My time is valuable. It's compensated equally, then starts to play out in the various avenues of the organization. You also saw this in the behaviors and the interactions as well. So people were extremely respectful of each other's time, how they interacted with with one another, respectful, The hierarchies that exist in other parts of the prevailing culture didn't really happen here because of this idea that my time is as valuable as yours. Therefore, we are equal. And as colleagues, I can approach you about a question. Um, We can work together. Um, There was a lot more mentorship and helping of uh, younger or newer colleagues that were coming into the organization really incredible, don't you think? So you can start to see how value interactions or how a value that's defined can then define the interactions and the behaviors that then create this incredible culture that this group developed. My advice to them was don't change a thing. You have something totally amazing here. It's absolutely incredible. What they started to see was as people started to hear about this incredible culture that they built, they started to become a magnet for, uh, they're, they're starting now to become a magnet for staff. Um, and you know, we're dealing with an environment where we have a major staffing shortage, especially in uh, medical practice right now, after two years of very difficult and trying time, um, many organizations are struggling right now. This organization is doing better than their peers because their culture is starting to attract the staff um, that they they want to work with. So this is interesting. And, and I must say that it's very important to define what your culture is. So this group did a great job of that. They defined what their culture is. They said, we want equality and how we're going to do that is show this through equal pay for time. Another area that they value is transparency. There are a number of ways that transparency plays out in the way that they operate. Absolutely incredible. At the same time, I've also experienced another culture that defined themselves by not being like something else. So they define themselves as not being like a prevailing culture. They were trying to build a subculture and they did very well by saying, we are not like this prevailing culture. But the only way for that organization to continue under its current structure was that people had an understanding and experience of that prevailing culture. So for example, one of the things that they valued, that they, they wanted to change um, in their subculture was they didn't want guilt and shame to be a central part of the community. And so the prevailing culture is very steeped in guilt and shame. It's a, you know, the way that a lot of things happen in that prevailing culture, the way that social control is meted out is using guilt and shame, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what you get is a highly homogenous culture that is highly, um, you know, centralized um, and oriented around leadership. Um, you know, that was what has been desired for 
you know, hundreds of years for this prevailing culture, it's been very important to have this um, centrality, this uniformity. It's helped them survive over many, many, many hundreds of years, many centuries. But this subculture that was desired defined itself as being absent of those things. So what happened? Well, that subculture eventually died. And the reason is because in order to be part of that subculture, in order to join that subculture, you had to have A, an understanding of the prevailing culture, and B, a desire to not participate in certain behaviors or activities that went along with that prevailing culture, specifically guilt and shame driven um, cultural activities and norming type behavior. And that culture eventually has died. And um, the reason is because as people, you know, as people do in their lives, move on or, you know, have to leave or also get old, um, that group becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually no longer exists because it's only a subgroup or a cultural group when there are more than, you know, one person being part of that. You have to have a group of people in order to have a culture. So if you're in charge of building or you want to build a really great, amazing subculture, you have to define it by what you are, not by what you aren't. So defining it by what you are, then you also need to understand the behaviors that you want. You want to show those behaviors. And as the leader, you're the one who needs to be demonstrating those. And you also need to be helping to reinforce them, reinforce those behaviors that you want to see. So you're going to do this by Uh, When you see behaviors that are outside of the definition of desired, um, so they're undesirable behaviors, you're going to have to correct those. You're going to have to negatively reinforce what you don't want to see. Um, You're going to want to reinforce those behaviors that you do want to see. And over time, you're going to start to build that incredible subculture. The other thing is, is that if you really want to build an amazing culture, um, and you're a leader of a team, remember that there are several things that just go without saying, um, respect of individuals, um, having mutual respect, uh, respecting the people that you work with as well as autonomy, um, inclusion and asking for opinions and, uh, you know, and also participatory decision-making in, in a lot of cases, um, you know, to really help build that. And by participatory decision-making, I don't mean, um, you know, having everybody around the table bring forward their opinion and then try to make a decision altogether. Um, but it's really about having people participate in the decision-making process more than it is about having people participate in the decision itself. Um, we'll get into more about what that means in another episode, but, um, you know, the idea is participatory. So not um, authoritarian, top down, don't involve. You actually want to build relationships and you want to build interactions that happen not only between you and those individuals in the team and you and maybe the other leaders or managers, but also you want to start to see those interactions happening at a peer to peer basis. You want to see those interactions happening Um, between other leaders and peers, you want to see them bottom up as well. So as you start to build it, your indicator for success is if you're starting to see those behaviors happening independently of your intervention. That's what you want. You want to see a self-perpetuating cycle of cultural reinforcement of the desired behaviors that happen, whether you're there or not. So uh, I hope that helps with a few things to think about around behavior, uh, around uh, building this incredible uh, culture, as well as you know what you need to think about in terms of those behaviors and interactions, and what you want to see, and how you know if you're doing a good job. So good luck to you, and uh, you know we're closing off this month, uh, Culture Month, here at uh, Chart House and at the Change Course Podcast. I hope that you've enjoyed all of this exciting cultural content and that, uh, you know, you 
learned a little bit too. I certainly have as I've gone through and reviewed all of these things I've collected through the years on culture and how we change culture and then also how we change successfully in the context of culture. So if you missed any of our podcasts or posts, certainly go back and check them out. Um, and we are back to our regular programming as we, uh, you know, head back to school, quote unquote, in September. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, I invite you to like, rate, share, and subscribe because it helps others find us. Our music is Levity by Emily Clausen. Change Course can be found wherever you get your podcasts. And we have an accessible version with fully edited captions on YouTube. You can find the link to this version on www.charthouse.ca in the Change Course podcast show notes. While you're visiting us, sign up for the Change Navigator newsletter. We're launching shortly, and you'll get a monthly dispatch of all things change and hear about the upcoming launch of ConnectedChange.com. Thank you for listening, and remember, it's never too late to change course.